On the day this was all happening, no factories were opened anywhere in the world. All offices and schools were closed. Nobody moved away from the television screens, not even for a couple of minutes to get a Coke or to feed the baby. The tension was unbearable. Everyone heard the American president's invitation to the men from Mars to visit him in the White House. And they also heard the weird rhyming reply, which sounded rather threatening. They also heard a piercing scream, which was Grandma Josephine. And a little later on, they heard someone shouting, Scram! 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 Mr. Wonka. Nobody could make us the head or tail of the shouting. They took it to be some kind of Martian language. But when the eight mysterious astronauts suddenly rushed back into the glass capsule and broke away from the space hotel, you could almost hear the great sigh of relief that rose up from all the people of the Earth. Telegrams and messages poured into the White House congratulating the President upon his brutal handling of a frightening situation. The President himself remained calm and thoughtful. He sat at his desk rolling a piece of wet chewing gum between his finger and thumb. He was waiting for the moment when he could flick it at Mrs. Tibbs without her seeing him. He flicked it at Miss Mrs. Tibbs, but hit the, the chief of the Air Force on the tip of his nose. Do you think the men from Mars have accepted my invitation? The president asked. Of course they have, said the foreign secretary. It was a brilliant speech, sir. They're probably on their way right now, said Miss Tibbs. Go and wash that nasty, sicky chewing gum off your fingers quickly. They could be here any minute. Let's have a song first, said the president. Sing another one about me, Nanny, please. The nurse's song. The mighty man of who I sing, the greatest of them all, was once just a teeny little thing, just 18 inches tall. I knew him as a tiny tot, I nursed him on my knee. I used to sit him down on pot and wait for him to weep. I always washed between his toes and cut his little nails. I brushed his hair and wiped his nose and weighed him on the scales. Through happy childhood days he strayed as all nice children should. I smacked him when he disobeyed and stopped when he was good. It soon began to dawn on me he was not very bright, because when he was 23 he couldn't read or write. What shall we do? His parents saw his parents got the vapors. He couldn't get a j even. He couldn't get a job delivering the papers. Aha! I said, this little clot could be a politician. Nanny, he cried. Oh, nanny, what a super proposition! Okay, I said. Let's learn to make the art of politics. I'll teach you how to miss the boat and how to drop some bricks. And how to win the people's votes and lots of other tricks. Let's learn to make a speech a day upon the TV screen, in which you never and ever say exactly what you mean. And most important, by the way, is not to let your teeth decay and keep your fingers clean. And now that I am 89, it's too late to repent. The fall was mine to the little swan became the president. Bravo, nanny, cried the president, clapping his hand. Hooray, shouted the others. Well done, Miss Vice President, man. Brilliant. Tremendous. My goodness, said the president. Those men from Mars will be here any moment. What on earth are we going to give them for lunch? Where's my chief cook? Chief cook was a Frenchman. He was also a French spy, and at this moment he was listening in the keyhole of the president's study. Ici, monsieur le president, he said, bursting in. Chief cook, what do men from Mars eat for lunch? Mars bars, said the chief cook. Baked or boiled? Oh, baked, of course, monsieur le president. You will ruin a bar's bar by boiling. The voice of astronaut Shuckworth cut in over the loudspeaker. Request permission to link up and go aboard the space hotel? Permission granted, said the president. Go right ahead, Shuckworth. It's all clear now, thanks to me. And so the large transport capsule, piloted by Shuckworth, Shanks, and Schaller, with all the hotel managers and assistant managers, the hall ports, and bass tree ships, and bellboys and wishes, and all that, moved in smoothly and linked up with all the giant space hotel. Hey there, we've lost our television picture, said the president. I'm afraid the camera got smashed again on the side of the space hotel, Mr. President, Shuckworth replied. The president said a very rude word into the microphone, and 10 million children across the nation became repeatedly gleefully and got smacked by their parents. All astronauts and 150 hotel staff safely aboard the space hotel, Shuckworth reported over the radio. We are now standing in the lobby. And what do you think of it all? Asked the president. He knew the whole world was letting, and he didn't, and he wanted Shuckworth to say how wonderful it was. Shuckworth didn't let it down. Gee, Mr. President, it's just great. It's unbelievable. It's so enormous, and it's kind of hard to find the words. It's just truly grand, especially the chandeliers and the carpets and all. I have the chief hotel manager, Mr. Walter W. Wall, beside me. He would like the honor of a word with you, sir. Put him on, said the president. Mr. President, sir, this is Walter Wall. What a sumptuous hotel this is. The decorations are superb. Have you noticed that all the walls 
are Walter Wall, Mr. Walter Wall, said the president. I have indeed. All the way wallpaper is all Walter Wall as well, Mr. Walter Wall. Yes, sir. Isn't that something? It's going to be a real pleasure running a beautiful hotel like this. Hey, what's going on over there? Something's coming out of the lips. Help! Suddenly, the lunch speaker in the president's study gave it a series of the most ghastly screams and yells. What on earth's going on? Shuckworth! Are you there, Shuckworth? Shank! Shallard! Mr. Walter Wall! Where are you all? What's happening? The screams continued. They were so loud, the president had to put his fingers in his ears. Every house in the world had a television or a radio receiver heard those awful screams. There were other noises, too. Loud grunts and snorties and crunching noises. And there was silence. Frantically, the president called the Space Hotel on the radio. Houston called the Space Hotel. The president called Houston. Houston called the president. Then both of them called the Space Hotel again. But the answer came up there was none. Up in the space, all was silent. Something's nasty happened. It's those men from Mars, said the ex-chief of the army. I told you to let me build them up. Shut up, snapped the president. I've got to think. The loudspeaker began to crackle. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Are you receiving me, Space Control in Houston? And the president grabbed the mic on his desk. Leave this to me, Houston. President Gilligrass here receiving you loud and clear. Go ahead. Astronaut Shuckworth here, Mr. President, back aboard the transport capsule. Thank the heavens. What happened, Shuckworth? Who's with you? We're most of us here. I guess we lost maybe a couple, a dozen people altogether. It was sure a scramble getting out of that place alive. What do you mean you lost two dozen people? Where'd they go? Gobbled up. One gulp and that was it. I saw a big six foot tall assistant manager being swallowed up just like you swallow a lump of ice cream. No chewing, nothing. Just down the hatch, Mr. President. But who, yelled the president, who are you talking about? Who did the swallowing? Hold it, cried Chuckworth. Oh, my lord, here they all come now. They're coming after us. They're swarming at the space hotel. They're coming out in swarms. You'll have to excuse me a moment, Mr. President. No time to talk.